Let me tell you a story. When I was 34, I got the chance of a lifetime, a job interview at the White House to become a presidential speechwriter. Unfortunately, uh, as I sat there uh, watching the chief speechwriter read through my resume, he started frowning. And he looks up and he says, you've got a lot of other projects going on. What's this about building a cork boat? <laughs> and I told him the truth, that uh, since the age of seven, I'd been saving corks from wine bottles to build a Viking ship. And that my plan was eventually, when I had enough, got the boat built to take it on an epic voyage through the canals of French wine country. And he just looked at me like, who is this nut job? <laughs> and I could feel the entire interview and my, my shot at the White House slipping away. I didn't know what to say. And then, all of a sudden, this analogy pops into my head. And I said, sir, building a cork boat and writing a good speech are a lot alike. In both cases, take a jumble of small things, corks or words that don't do much on their own. But if you put them into just the right order, they'll take you on an amazing voyage. He got the analogy, and I got the job. <laughs> and that's the thing about a good analogy at the right moment, uh, because it helps people see things from an entirely uh, fresh uh, perspective. And tonight I'm going to talk about uh, the impact that analogies can uh, make on, on the world and how each of us can strengthen our own analogical instinct. First, some of you might be wondering what exactly is an analogy? After all, they come in a lot of different disguises. Metaphors, cliches, parables, proverbs, legal arguments. Here's a useful definition. At its core, an analogy is a comparison that asserts similarities between two different things. And whether we realize it or not, we make analogical comparisons all the time. For example, when we use our phones to navigate and get from A to B, we follow the blue dot on the screen and we're looking up and comparing that uh, to the real world around us. That map is a two-dimensional analog of the three-dimensional world. And intuitively, we just uh, filter out everything that's different about the two, and almost everything is, to zero in on uh, the relevant similarities that, that get us where we want to go. And that capacity to uh, filter and compare uh, is our analogical instinct hard at work. Now, as we navigate the world of ideas, the, uh, a good analogy, as a creative catalyst, can take us places we never even imagined. For example, uh, what do pigs and cars have in common? Most of us would say, nothing. Uh, but in 1913, a, a Detroit mechanic named Bill Klan took a trip to Chicago where he went on a tour of the Swift meatpacking plant. And Swift had this in incredibly efficient system for uh, dismembering and processing millions of pigs and sheep and cattle every year. And, and uh, it was uh, simple. They, they hung the carcasses on an overhead uh, track from a hook and assigned butchers to make a designated cut. They'd slide the, the meat on down to the next butcher for the next cut, and, and so on. And Klan, who worked for the Ford Motor Company, uh, drew an analogy. And he asked himself, well, if they can use a, a moving track to disassemble pigs, why couldn't we just reverse the process to assemble cars? And so he took this idea for moving assembly back to Detroit, where his bosses, including Henry Ford, thought it was a stupid idea. But he insisted, no, this is going to change the world. This is revolutionary. Give it a try. And they put in a line, actually when Henry Ford was out of town on business. And lo and behold, it made a dramatic and immediate impact. Uh, uh, before the line went in, it took a, a team of workers uh, about 12 and a half hours to make a Model T. With the line, 90 minutes per car. 
And that let Ford make a lot more cars at a lot lower cost, double wages, uh, and create the first mass market for automobiles in America. And even more importantly, it completely revolutionized manufacturing in every other industry, unlocking trillions in, in economic potential and, and changing the course of history. And that's the great thing about a great analogy. It can show us entirely new ways of, of getting a job done, of better ways of getting a job done. But be careful, because if we choose the wrong analogy, uh, it can have terrible consequences and, and lead us uh, astray. Um, ask yourself, why does uh, uh, the United States incarcerate 2.3 million people? That's a quarter of the world's entire prison population. Well, one major contributing factor is a, is a very seductive, uh, yet flawed, uh, analogy. And here, here's how it happened. In 1994, uh, a father whose daughter had been murdered uh, by, uh, in a botched robbery uh, by a pair of uh, convicted felons uh, led a ballot initiative in California uh, to require mandatory sentences of 25 years to life for a third felony conviction. And he called it three strikes and you're out. And three strikes was an easy sell. After all, baseball is fair. Everybody plays by the same rules, and everybody is held accountable for their errors. And California voters passed it in a landslide, and about half the other states uh, followed suit with their own version of, of three strikes uh, laws. Now, did this take violent felons off the street? Absolutely. Unfortunately, uh, it caught a lot of other people uh, as well, uh, because judges who had previously had some discretion in sentencing were now required by law to sentence all third strikes uh, to long sentences, whether that third strike was uh, a shoplifting a video or stealing loose change from a parked car or passing a, a bad check. And, and what did this do? It filled up our prisons uh, at a cost of now $75 billion, billion dollars a year, and thousands and thousands of ruined lives. Now, the problem, uh, so we, we have to revisit the, the, the analogy and ask, why should baseball be the model for sentencing policy? And the problem is not that uh, three strikes and you're out it oversimplifies things because all analogies simplify. That's, that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, it's that the emotional appeal, uh, uh, baseball is fair, distracted millions and millions of voters uh, from more relevant disqualifying differences between the game of baseball and criminal justice. But before we dismiss emotional, emotionally appealing analogies, we need to recognize that those emotional appeals can be extraordinarily uh, empowering as well. A few minutes ago, uh, I talked about using our phones uh, to navigate. Uh, well, when I was growing up in, here in Ann Arbor, you couldn't just slip a computer in your pocket. Uh, it, it took up the mainframe here at U of M, took up the entire floor of a building right next door. The building's gone, and so is the mainframe. Uh, but uh, the other thing was that, that you had to be a techie or a scientist to use it. And computers were something that, to most people, were alien and unfriendly. Steve Jobs changed all that with a friendly, an explicitly friendly analogy. The desktop, along with the intuitive digital icons of tools that people already knew how to use. Folders, documents, scissors, a trash can. And he reasoned that if people felt comfortable uh, using those tools on a regular physical desk, they ought to be just as comfortable 
uh, using them uh, in a digital equivalent. Now, of course, it wasn't his idea originally. The, the concept was first developed at Xerox, but management there didn't recognize its potential. He, Jobs did, uh, and put it to work uh, designing and, and launching the Mac in 1984. And almost overnight, millions of people could suddenly use a computer, but more importantly, they wanted to use a computer. Uh, and that democratized computing power. It reshaped our relationship with information, and it revolutionized the way that millions and millions of people work and communicate uh, today. Now, you might say, oh, the desktop, that's obvious. Or the moving assembly line, duh, anybody could have thought of that. But they didn't, because those, uh, those underlying analogies uh, were, were, were not obvious, uh, or else other people would have exploited them. Uh, and similarly, you might say that three strikes and you're out was obviously a dumb analogy. Um, but yet millions of people rushed to embrace it. So my point is not that analogies are good or bad per se, but that we as citizens need to think very critically uh, about those we encounter because they shape how we respond uh, to challenges and opportunities. Someone asked uh, Thomas Edison once, what qualities do you look for in an inventor? And he said, three things. First, imagination. Second, persistence. And third was a logical mind that sees analogies. And that's because we can only explain or invent something new uh, by recombining or reconfiguring or reimagining what we already have or know. The world today has a lot of problems. Climate change, rising sea levels, pandemics, mass extinction, uh, and we're unlikely to solve these problems with yesterday's thinking because it was yesterday's thinking that got us into this mess. We need new solutions, new ideas, new breakthroughs, and these are inevitably going to flow from the creative wellspring of analogy. Fortunately, our analogical instinct uh, is like a muscle. The more we exercise it, the stronger it gets. So for those of you who want to sharpen your thinking, boost your creative metabolism, and, and improve your problem-solving skills, here are three guidelines. First, practice spotting all the analogies you encounter uh, in your daily life. Once you start paying close attention, you'll see and hear them everywhere. Second, once you spot an analogy, challenge the argument that it's making. What about that analogy isn't true? And how uh, relevant are its strengths and weaknesses? And finally, when you are trying to solve a problem, uh, consider multiple analogies, because usually uh, different analogies will shed useful light on different aspects of the problem. In the end, we have to remember uh, analogies are just models that help us uh, interpret and understand the world, and no analogy is ever going to be perfect. Uh, as the great statistician E.P. Box once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. I would add, some can even change the world. So I wish you well in all your endeavors, and may your best analogies ring true. Thank you.